Hello, welcome to our panel discussion led by three Omna Tigray experts, co-sponsored by Harvard ESA, Howard ESA, Emory EESU, and GSU ESA. My name is Candice Magasa. I'm co-chair of the Ethiopian Eritrean Student Association here at Cornell. Um, I will be joined by one of our co-event leads, uh, Luam Asfal, who will be the moderator for the Q&A portion. And I would like you to thank, I would like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to learn more about the humanitarian crisis. And I hope you leave having learned something new and feeling inspired to spread awareness about the crisis. Uh, now I'd like to welcome our guest speakers to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Faven Gurmai, and I am a mem board member of the Global Society of Tigrayan Scholars. It is a pleasure to be here with you all today. Hello, my name is Moaz Akide. I am a member of Omna Tigray and an international relations researcher. I'm very glad to be here today. My name is Yersalem Gurmai. I'm the CCO of Omna Tigray, and thank you all for having me. So great, it looks like I'm gonna jump in with a uh, short presentation afterwards, the, the rest of the panelists will give their insights. I'm going to share my screen. So first I wanna focus on Ethiopia's history, excuse me, as it provides context into the current war in Tibet. Given that Ethiopia is a nation with a long and complex history, I will not attempt to dissect it, but rather will provide a cursory review as a backdrop to Ethiopia's recurring issues with political unitarianism and Ahmada hegemony, as they have a direct effect on the current war. I will outline how Emperor Menelik, Emperor Haile Selassie, and the Durg regime saw absolute political control and tried to forcefully institute Amhara culture as the foundation of Ethiopian identity, despite the country's cultural diversity. And while each of these regimes was met with fierce opposition, the current prime minister of Ethiopia, Abiy Ahmed, is seeking to re-implement the repressive and assimilationist policies of the past. The first historical factor I wanna discuss is the political unitarianism that characterized both Ethiopia's process of imperial expansion and the governance of the country afterward. Since land was the most valuable resource in ancient Ethiopian polities, its acquisition became the key driver of imperial expansion throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Throughout this period, the Amhara dominated core of Menelik II's empire used military force to more than double Ethiopia's size. More specifically, Menelik gradually annexed the highland periphery of the Ethiopian plateau and then its surrounding lowlands. This was a classic pattern of empire building that imposed different modes of governments on annexed territories. These areas were then largely integrated into the empire and administered through a centralized bureaucracy that sought to maintain control and exact rents. The local peasantry was subjugated to serfdom and tied to its land by an elaborate mechanism of taxes and services, while local elites were either suppressed or co-opted into the existent feudal Amhara hierarchy. In this process of imperial expansion and consolidation, entire principalities and even population groups were eliminated, most notably the Oromo, who are, who are estimated to have lost 5 million people. The various groups in the southern part of the country, forcibly incorporated into the Ethiopian empire, are now citizens of what we know today to be the Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. The collective memory of violence that certain groups suffered in this process has remained fresh in a number of cases to this day, owing to the continued experience of unitary political control and targeted ethnic persecution. Menelik's successor, Emperor Haile Selassie, significantly elaborated attempts to forge cultural homogenization through political unitarianism and a one language policy during most of the 20th century. More specifically, Selassie attempted to create a unitary state on the basis of cultural assimilation using Amharic as a sole language of instruction and public discourse, and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church culture, Christian church culture as a core culture of the Ethiopian national identity. He sought to keep with the pan-Ethiopian nationalist perspective. Yet this was underpinned by Selassie's belief in Amhara's, Amhara's superiority. Beyond the policy of assimilation, Selassie is reviled for the discrimination, subjugation, repression, and exploitation of all forms applied to ethnic Tigrayans, Oromos, Hararis, and other non-Amhara ethnic groups. Under Selassie, everything possible was done to destroy Oromo identity. The Harari people faced mass persecution and displacement. Policies were implemented to destroy Tigray's economic and social structure. Famine in the Wolo and Tigrayan regions were disregarded. In reality, the full extent of Selassie's crimes are too numerous and frankly, too ghastly for the scope of this discussion. 
However, the last 14 years of Celeste's reign witnessed growing opposition to his regime. The cultural and structural inequalities that typified Celeste's rule continued to aggravate ethnic and regional discontent until the revolution of 1974 overthrew the monarchy. Unfortunately, the overthrow of Emperor Haile Selassie and the collapse of a centuries old monarchy did not usher in a system of democratic rule or justice in Ethiopia. Disorganized as they were, the civilian forces that fought to dismantle Selassie's regime could not provide leadership to the revolution. And as a result, the military stepped into the vacuum and paved way for military rule that eventually evolved into a one-man dictatorship under Mangustu Haile Mariam. Mangustu's regime, also referred to as the Derg, ultimate aim was the creation of a one-party system. Early on, they were responsible for human rights violations on an enormous scale, including the torture, murder, and so-called disappearance of tens of thousands of Ethiopians. Beyond the political marginalization that defied the Derg, land degradation, reoccurring famines, and massive unemployment was summoned a call for pan-Ethiopian, ethno-nationalist, and Eritrean nationalist movements to tackle the repressive the repression of all subjugated groups. By the early 1980s, the TPLF had grown to become the main adversary of the century of the central military government, along with the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, which was fighting for Eritrea's independence. By the early 1980s, the TPLF had grown to become the main adversary of the central military government, along with the, along with, by the early 1980s, the TPLF had grown to become the main adversary of the central military government, along with the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, which was fighting for Eritrea's independence. The TPLF would later join other forces to form the EPRDF, which with the EPLF defeated Mangusu's forces throughout, the throughout 1990 and 1991. In the end, ethnic nationalism became a major factor in the demise of the military dictatorship. When the EPRDF ruling coalition established a system of ethnic federalism after coming to power in 1991, it served a clear purpose. Following the end of the war, the post-conflict government led by Mala Sinawi needed to balance the demands of over 90 ethnic groups many of which were organized into armed nationalist movements. Ethnic federalism, which divided Ethiopia into 10 semi-autonomous states and two multi-ethnic cities, granted larger ethnic groups a greater degree of self-governance and offered recognition and reduced levels of autonomy to many smaller groups. To ensure the protection of each state's sovereignty, Article 39 of the Ethiopian Constitution provides each state with the right to self-determination, including the right to secession. In another contrast to the previous regimes, Ethiopia's ethnic federalism was characterized by cultural pluralism, including language pluralism, giving each regional state the right to choose its own working language. Despite the EPRDF's attempt to democratize Ethiopia for the first time, there were shortfalls tied to the continuous dominance of the Ethiopian state by the TPLF-led EPRDF from 1991 to 2018. So you may be asking, why is this important now? And it's because the recent political changes by Abiy Ahmed and his administration have led to vigorous attempts to establish a unitary state and reinstate Amhara hegemony, which we know from looking back at Ethiopian history, resembles the authoritarian and colonial models of the previous Ethiopian le leaders, namely Menelik II and Haile Selassie. Abiy was willed into office by the relentless work of Kero protesters and Oromo nationalist movement. Despite his promises to be inclusive and widen the political space, he has adopted an oppressive style, begun a strict crackdown on criticism, and abandoned the strategy of widespread arrests. Abiy has taken a stance against Abi has taken a stance against federalism simply because it helps him do away with democracy. Since taking office, Abiy has been working to implement a unitarist political agenda. One such example is the use of the Prosperity Party to centralize political power under his leadership. Whatever autonomy the regional states practiced before the Prosperity Party disappeared with the dissolution of EPRDF. And now, Ethiopia is being governed by a single party, which is not only unelected, but is also unconstitutional. While there are additional factors at play, TPLF's refusal to align itself with Abiy's vision for a unitary state has led him to wage an all-out war in Tigray. He could not subdue the region or the TPLF in the same way he did with opposition in Oromia and other groups. The region is politically autonomous and retains effective control of its territory. It also has significant military capacity in terms of troops and weaponry. Abiy's main aim is to replace Tigray's leadership with a government that is subordinate to the central state. His position would be stronger without pressure from Tigrayans and Oromo, which not only explains why there is a current war on Tigray, but also why more than 50,000 Oromos have been either persecuted or imprisoned. 
So that gives you some domestic context in this work. I will now move on to discuss the historical rivalry between Tigray and Eritrea, as it is another element that has bled into the war on Tigray. While EPLF and TPLF guerrilla movements worked closely to overthrow the Derg in 1991, they were divided in a number of factors, including definitions of nationalism and the demarcation of borders. Relations were further strained by the introduction of the Eritrean currency, the Nafka, in 1997. Ethiopia would not accept an Eritrean proposal that both currencies should circulate freely in both countries, which disrupted trade and caused considerable hardship for Eritrea. Despite these tensions, government delegations were free-flowing free until 1998, when Eritrea officially fell out with the TPLF-led government over the disputed territory of Badami, which lies on Eritrea's and Tigray's border. A horrific war was waged between the two countries for two years, killing between 70,000 to 100,000, 120,000, excuse me, soldiers and civilians. Although the military conflict ended in 2000, both states spent the next two decades on a war footing, with troops massed on the border and funding proxy elements to destabilize one another. Since 2000, the TPLF-led Ethiopian government largely succeeded in getting much of the world to establish warm diplomatic ties with Addis Ababa and isolating Eritrea internationally as a pariah state. Eritrea was left with little leverage or diplomatic clout when it slapped with sanctions and an arms embargo by the UN in 2009 for allegedly supporting extremist groups in Somalia. Esaias spent years lashing out at Addis Ababa and the TPLF, who he blamed for Eritrea's isolation. A peace agreement between Ethiopia and Eritrea was signed in 2018 by Abiy and Esaias. While it formally ended the war, the exact details of the treaty are unknown. It's likely that there was an objective alliance among the two against the TPLF, and more broadly, a common concern to avoid a rising call for Tigrayan independence. Abi appears to have one a staunch ally in size, as Eritrean forces are heavily engaged in the war on Tigray, backing Ethiopia. So that concludes my discussion on the historical context of the war, which I hope has provided you with some understanding of the complexity behind the current war in Tigray. I will now move on to discuss the events since 2018 that have served as a catalyst to the war. So as I mentioned previously, Tigrayans were perceived as a threat to authoritarians as they were known to resist subjugation. Because of this, prior to the war officially being waged on Tigray, Prime Minister Abiy took, took steps to weaken Tigray's social, economic, and political structure. Politically, Tigray's regional government was largely sidelined and disproportionately targeted by the federal government for corruption and human rights abuses. Economically, Abiy has allowed the surrounding region to implement road blockades designed to cripple Tigray's economy. He has reduced Tigray's budget and sometimes even blocked Tigray's budget and hindered the fight against the recent locust infestation, which plagued the region. Moreover, between 2018 and 2020, there were a series of assassinations of prominent political figures, which fueled the growing instability and heightened ethnic tensions in Ethiopia. All of the assassinations had two common factors. One, the victims privately or publicly criticized Prime Minister Abiy, and two, the results of the investigation into their deaths are still unclear. Tigray's regional elections are arguably one of the primary drivers between the current war. And one of the most extreme examples of political overreach, Abiy unconstitutionally postponed that national, postponed, excuse me, national and regional elections, which were supposed to be held on August 29th, 2020. He argued that the deferment was due to COVID-19, even though many countries were able to safely hold elections. The Tigray state saw this for what it was, which was a stall tactic, as Abiy knew that being elected was unlikely. He lost his core support following the jailing of Oromo leaders and the deaths of those of Walaita, Ben Shangul, and Gumu's descent. The Tigray regional state refused to curtail self rule and proceeded with the mandated regional elections. After implementing safety measures, more than 2.5 million people casted their votes in Tigray. And after winning the election, the TPLF and the federal government subsequently called each other illegitimate. Well, I'll be claimed that the November 4th attack on Tigray was in response to the TPLF's attack of Northern Command, TPLF's claims of acting in self-defense have some merit. Political analysts and diplomats in the region had confirmed that there were evident signs of preparations to attack the TPLF prior to November 2020, including requests for neighboring Sudan to close its border between the two countries prior to November 4th. And Ethiopian generals also recorded admitting that they were preparing for the war before the alleged attack by the TPLF in November and members of the Amhara state also went on record, stating they were waiting in anticipation. 
So I hope that gave you some context into the more recent developments leading up to the war. I will now move forward to discuss the devastating humanitarian crisis that is unfolding as a result. For a long time, Ethiopia has had an image synonymous with famine and hunger, largely due to the famine in the 1980s and the subsequent aid fundraising by those in the West. What most people don't recognize is that the deaths were mostly from political rather than environmental factors. And yet again, that's the case. Four months into the war, there are unconfirmed reports of Tigray, there are confirmed more reports, excuse me, of Tigrayans dying from starvation. Foreign forces are exacerbating the food crisis as Eritrean and Amhara regional forces are engaged in mass looting and the destruction of crops. Over 4.5 million Tigrayans are at risk for starvation. Over 2 million children remain cut off from emergency humanitarian assistance. UNICEF has dispatched 655 metric tons of emergency supplies, but the majority of Tigrayans living in rural areas are still inaccessible. The war has also caused a massive healthcare emergency affecting over 6 million people. Millions are without life-saving medication and are either dying at home or traveling for days to reach a functioning hospital. Pregnant women are forced to deliver their babies in hazardous environments, and many others have died from preventable diseases. With the limited medical resources and space, the risk of cholera and a COVID outbreak, quite frankly, is considerably high in cities across Tigray. The war on Tigray has also displaced millions and sent more than 61,000 Ethiopians to Sudan's provinces. So it goes without saying that there have been mass atrocities committed in this war by both domestic and international forces. There are reports of widespread, mass widespread massacres committed by ENDF, Amhara militia, more specifically FANNO, Eritrean forces, and the Amhara special forces all throughout Tigray. Refugees that escaped into Sudan also reported being ethnically targeted during the massacres. An internal US government report described looted houses and deserted villages where tens of thousands of people are still unaccounted for. The report added that fighters and officials from the neighboring Amhara region are using force and intimidation to remove Tigrayans from Western Tigray. The war has also led to substantial war crimes that are sexually violent in nature. International aid and medical workers in Tigray, medical workers in the Sudanese refugee camps, and Ethiopian military officials have all confirmed the increasing number of sexual and gender-based violence in Tigray. Hospital aid agencies are operating out of Tigray estimate that thousands of women have been raped by Eritrean and Ethiopian soldiers. In both Tigray and Sudan, doctors aid and aid workers have recounted harrowing stories from rape survivors. Most of these women have said they were forced to choose between rape or death. Others were raped in exchange for basic commodities such as food and water. And finally, I want to outline some of the global impl implications on a will have on its neighboring Sudan border. Beyond Eritrea's presence, the war has spilled into Sudan. The, the fertile Al-Fashka region, a disputed area where the Amhara region and Sudan meet, is the cause of recent arms clashes along the border. Ethiopia's descent into the war against Tigray provided Sudan with the opportunity for it to reclaim disputed land, which has escalated tensions between the, the two countries. Sudan has accused Abiy of attempting to force its hand over the region by holding up negotiations and filling the Gerd Dam over near the border. Filling the dam without an agreement could cause broader border implications. If something isn't done soon, the war on Tigray will continue to destabilize the Horn of Africa, leading to severe geopolitical implications. Thank you. Thank you, Faven, for providing that contextual analysis. I think a lot of Ethiopian history is often misunderstood because it is very vast and complex. So um, I think that really helps to provide some much needed background into what's happening. And uh, if uh, we can continue, I'm gonna provide some questions to the panelists. Uh, Adale is joining us now. So if you'd like to introduce yourself. Welcome to Adale, if you'd like to introduce yourself to the audience. I believe you're muted. Yeah, hi, um, good evening. I was under the impression that it was going to start at um, 11 p.m. my time, so apologies for being late. Um, 
Can you get the audio feed now? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Um, it's kind of getting disconnected, but if you get the audio feed, can you please confirm? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. So this is Sadala, Sadala Lama from uh, the Addis Standard magazine. I I guess that's, that's so much I can say. <laughs> Thank you uh, for the introduction. And uh, Faven just concluded providing a contextual um, analysis of what's happening from Menelik to current time. And it was very much from a Tigrayan perspective. And I'd like to hear more about what you have to say about what's happening um, in Romia. And if you could provide some genesis of the Romo protests, the Ero Romo movement, and what happened from 2014 to the resignation of Prime Minister Haile Mariam de Salen in 2018, um, and kind of relating that to what's happening now with the unrest in Oromia. Yeah, um, good. So um, it's good that Fevan has given the background for that. So I'm gonna just jumpstart from, uh, um, as I said, from the 2014 um, protest that started first in Oromia and then was picked afterwards in Amhara Regional Estate. Um, but um, the, the 2014 protest um, was a very small protest that started in Ambo University first. Um, it, was, it was not a protest per se, it was just a demand, uh, a peaceful demand by university students against the, uh, the government's uh, expansion plan, uh, what they call it, the Addis Ababa Master Plan. Um, which um, is a plan that would see the, the, the city of Addis Ababa expanding into uh, its neighboring uh, region, its neighboring areas uh, in, in all the three, four, five directions. And these areas are uh, administratively belonging to the Oromia regional state. And so the 2014 uh, minor it was not a protest. It was, uh, as I said, it was uh, was more of like um, a, a question from from the university students, who most of them were coming from the families of the peasantry in the area surrounding Addis Ababa. And so that was very easy to contain, to control. Uh, but then it didn't it didn't go away at, at that. You know, the government was able to. Uh, put that down and arrest um, a couple of students at that time, um, but it did not make the questions to go away. So the questions returned back again in April, um, in, in, in May of 2015, uh, a, a general election took place in which the ruling party, the EPRD, if the Ethiopian People um, Revolutionary Democracy Front, as it was known at that time, had uh, won the election uh, more than 99.9% .9 of the, the parliament seat. Uh, then three months after that, the protests began. And this was what started a year ago in 2014. The questions did not change. The questions still remained that the, the, the students raised, um, but the protest changed from outside of the university campuses to um, to the streets because it started in a small town not far from Ambo, which is um, around 125 kilometers uh, west of the capital Addis Ababa. And so the, the protest um, began at that time in a small town called Ginchi. And the question was the same question that um, the university students raised a year prior to that. And that is what has started as a, as a small protest. And uh, that uh, was, of course, as a very typical of the government was met by um, a heavy crackdown, um, arrests for arrests, uh, uh, this time not just university students, but also uh, residents. Um, that didn't uh, make the questions to go away. Uh, and the protests remained pretty peaceful for the next two years, intermittent, uh, you know, on and off, 
uh, facing heavy crackdown from the government, uh, but but it didn't go away. It continued, and this time, um, you know, almost entirely, uh, the people in Romania regional state have joined from from the youth uh, to university students to high school and elementary students. So uh, even the elderly uh, joined the, the protest, and the questions are pretty much, you know, they, they become from the question of uh, resisting against the expansion of the, um, the capital city Addis Ababa to the right for self-determination. There were three outstanding questions as far as I remember as we were covering them. The, the first one is yes, um, initially, it was a question of let's have a say in the expansion of in this master plan. You know, the students were were, were just having let's let's discuss it with with the, the the peasantry that were about to affect to be affected by by this expansion project. Um, but now it was drop it all together. So you know we don't want to scrap it, cancel the the, the master plan, and also. Um, respect the, the right for self-determination of, of the Oromo people, uh, because what happened with the protest, with the, with, the first, with the one question that the protesters had, was the government the, from the center uh, uh, was, was changing the regional government's leadership uh, to make the questions go away. Um, you know, the people in the Romeo region, the authorities in the regional state that were deemed to be sympathizers of this question were being, you know, moved and removed and um, changed it all from, uh, by the order coming from, from Ratkilo in, in, in Addis Ababa from the federal government. And so this laid the questions to multiply into the right to self-administer, the right to be administered by the people that uh, uh, the Oromo uh, uh, population want to have uh, be governed with. And so this went on. And then the, the, the third question was a stop into the killing, uh, because this crackdown was, was accompanied by um, the killing and dismissal of thousands of students from universities uh, and also from high schools. And so the more the, the repression uh, became, the more the questions became harder and the more the resolve of the people in, um, in continuing to protest. And so this is what went on from 2015 all the way to 2018. But it was the turning point for this was the 2016 uh, October of 2016, uh, what we called the uh, Erecha massacre at that time, you know, there was a hashtag uh, known as the Erecha massacre. This was the um, still uh, unknown number of people uh, who have been killed during the annual ce celebration of um, Erecha, which is the uh, not really the e equivalent, but casually named as the Thanksgiving, the Oromo Thanksgiving, in which uh, really hundreds of thousands of people uh, attend every year in Bishoftu city. Uh, it's a cultural festival whereby the Oromo from all over the country come there to observe uh, the end of the rainy season uh, and give thanks to, to, to God. So it's one of the most peaceful uh, cultural gatherings uh, by the Oromo yet. And it's in this gathering that uh, a university student took a mic from, from one of the MCs uh, in the stage there, and he proclaimed at that, at that time, um, down, down Wayani, which is uh, the EPRDF government, which was predominantly controlled by the TPLF, um, uh, one of the four parties. Uh, that make up the, the ruling EPRDF at that time. And so this was the, the sound of the protest that really galvanized hundreds of thousands of people during this um, cultural festivity. And at that time, the police panicked and uh, there was a shooting into the air. And you can imagine what has happened afterwards. It was a, a complete stampede. And a lot of people were killed um, by the government's account, 52, but there are several accounts that put the number higher, anywhere between um, 100 to 200. And that's, uh, that, that was really the turning point of that protest. Um, and uh, it was also 
at that time that the ruling party in Urumia Regional State, which was part of the EPRDF coalition uh, that was known as the OPDO, which is the Oromo People Democratic Organization, had um, had to look inward at that time and you know make a decision whether to stand by the side of the people or continued to stand by the side of the the government from the federal uh, from the federal government and um, they have decided for the first time to elect a regional president um, outside of the realm outside of the knowledge of the federal government for the first time in 27 years since uh, the birth of that political party and it was at this time that they have elected uh, uh, who we call Lama Megersa, uh, who's no longer in the picture today, unfortunately. And so the, the election uh, by the by the regional ruling uh, party of Lama Megersa would turn out to be really a defining moment in the protest because uh, he pretty much resonated with the protesters, he adopted the question, he adopted even the language the protesters were, were using regarding self-determination, regarding the scrapping of the, um, the, the master plan from, from the federal government. Um, and he has uh, surrounded himself with a, a couple of more men uh, that included the current prime minister. Uh, particularly four of them would stand out to be to be known as Team Lama, uh, which, which no longer exists today. And so this was really uh, the time that the ruling um, coalition, the EPRDF, uh, was really tested because now the protest was, uh, was not only the people, but also uh, the party members of its own coalition, uh, the, the OPDU. And uh, this would bring in uh, really the end of the EPRDF government as we, as we, as we knew it. Um, so it went on for, for two years and it was during this time between 2016 and 2018, uh, up to the coming of the current prime minister that uh, we have seen uh, the Oromia regional state um, really completely gone, uh, in full mood of the protest and resisting anything and everything that was coming from the central government uh, that was the mode of you know, governance uh, previously. And so uh, this is when people now try to call that protest. It was a protest of the OPDO. Um, initially, this protest was not even adopted by the OPDO itself. In fact, the OPDO was part of the crackdown of the federal government against this grassroots movement by the Gero. Uh, Gero and Kare is, uh, is a, a term in Afghan Romo to define the youth, uh, Gero to define the men. Uh, array to define women. And so the OPDO itself was really against uh, this grassroots mobilization. And they were a part of the killing of the Keros and the Keres. Uh, uh, the police, for example, in Oromia Regional State were were a part of, of, uh, of the crackdown and they have uh, um, killed a lot of people um, all the way in, uh, be it in Ambo, in Dredawa, in, 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 in Bali, in Shashamani, everywhere you turn. Of course, the federal government uh, was also a backup. Uh, they would occupy a lot of uh, spaces in, in Ormea regional state, which uh, uh, was not authorized by the regional state there. Uh, but primarily at the forefront of this crackdown was the, the OPDO itself until 2016, at, that is, until Lama Megersa came into the picture. And so it was that two years that uh, between 2016, uh, October of 2016 and, uh, uh, and, and um, um, yeah, October 2016 to January 2018, uh, when the ruling party at that time, unable to contain its own arrangement as a coalition, um, sat down uh, for, a, for a meeting and they have come up with a lot of decision that included the resignation of Haile Mariam de Saleh. And so this is what led to the coming of Abiy Yahmed into the picture. Now, the Prime Minister Abiy Yahmed at that time was very not, not even known that much among uh, the Oromo people. He was a very low key uh, 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 profile as a minister uh, previously, but then uh, as a deputy president in Oromia Regional State, uh, particularly under the presidency of Lama Megersa, was in those two years. So he was. Um, 
somehow known to the Oromo people, uh, someone who accompanied uh, Lama Magersa uh, and uh, together with two other uh, figures who are pretty much obscure today. And so uh, it was that time that the EPRDF has decided um, to change a slew of things because the protest was um, joined by another protest in Amhara regional state. Uh, so the, the protest that began in Oromia was also you know, joined. And also there were small scale protesters that were nonetheless being brutally suppressed in Konso in the southern part of the country. And so it was this, this um, fracturing of the ruling coalition itself that forced the imperative uh, to sit down and look for um, an option. And I think, I, I believe there were around 12 issues that they said they would like to change. This was in December, January of um, 20, uh, 2018, 2019. And so uh, after 17 days of closed door session, they came up with what to do in order to reform their own party so they can, they can stay. And during this time, the TPLF was, um, uh, was a part of that. And so the four major parties that constituted the EPRDF as a governing uh, party um, decided to take several measures. Uh, consequential of all is the release of prisoners, um, and is uh, uh, li not liberalization at that time, but uh, partial privatization of uh, the economy and uh, the restoration of peace uh, with Eritrea and uh, the reform within the judici judiciary, the media uh, and security sector reform. So there were around 12 issues that they said they would like to see change it if the EPRD wanted to remain somehow as a governing party of the um, of the country. And part of that decision was also to see the Zen Prime Minister Haile Mariam de Salin depart from the office and uh, ha elect a new uh, chairman of the party, which was automatically taken as a prime minister. And this is when the current um, prime minister came into the picture um, because it was very much expected and known that the next prime minister or the next chairman of the party would come from the Oromo wing of the, the, the EPRDF, from the OPDO, where uh, the major protest was, uh, was, was being driven. And so naturally, it would have to be uh, Lama Magersa, but Lama Magersa was not a member of the national parliament which according to the party in laws of the EPRDF, laws of the EPRDF uh, would be required of him. So what Lama did at that time was to evacuate his, his place and give the chairmanship of the OPDO to the current prime minister, very much unknown to, to the Oromo people at that time. He, so he replaced himself as a chairman of the OPDO in order to pave the way uh, for, 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 for uh, his, his colleague, um, Abi Ahmed, to become the chairman of the EPRDF and by default, the prime minister of the country. And that would be a decision that was very much consequential because then um, Lama became this, the deputy of the, the deputy chairman of the OPDO and uh, Abi Ahmed became the chairman of the OPDO that uh, Abiy Ahmed was the, the, the member of the parliament at that time. And so this is what, what paved way, way for, for Abiy to be the prime minister. So in, in, a, in a sense, uh, the big misunderstanding that a lot of people assume today is the misunderstanding that Abiy Ahmed is uh, an elected prime minister. Uh, in fact, he is not only elected, but also came through a system of the 2015 election in which the ruling party rigged the election so massively that it led to that sustained uh, protest by, by the Oromo. And so he, he is not directly elected, but appointed as a, as a, you know, using the party system, the EPRDF that it was at that time. And so this is what, what led to his coming into a, a prime minister. When he came to, when he was sworn in, in April, 2018, prior to his, his being sworn in as a, as a prime minister, the EPRDF has already done a lot of major changes 
um, uh, what one of them would be the release of thousands of prisoners, uh, prisoners of conscience, as we uh, as we have seen, and this happened in. February already under the, pri the premiership of uh, the departing prime minister, Haile Mariam de Salin. Um, and so th this decision was um, uh, made as a collective decision by the EPRDF as a ruling party, as part of democratizing and reforming itself so that it could remain in the system uh, as a governing party until you know elections took place so prime minister abiy ahmed was 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 not even a part of that executive decision by the four parties to release the these thousands of prisoners uh, but but it happened um in, in february uh, and soon after the release of the prisoners, what happened was another major decision, which is the resignation of Haile Mariam de Saling as a prime minister. And so this was, uh, it happened just right the next day after he has decided to uh, announce it that uh, they were re releasing these prisoners. And so we had uh, between February of 2018 to April of 2018, um, uh, without without a designated prime minister uh, and and the party itself trying to elect who is going to represent uh, or replace the outgoing prime minister. These uh, two to three months were spent in this great uncertainty, um, uh, but it still it was the party that was still in place um, that were deciding who was going to replace. And it was obvious that uh, was the next prime minister would come from the Oromo. And, uh, and, and that is what ended up having um, Abi Ahmed uh, being elected the chairman of the EPR Dave, which is automatically taken as the prime minister of the country. So, this is how he came to to that position uh, but as we see today uh, the people that were at the forefront in bringing him uh, to his position are, are you, you don't see them or what we call the team lemma are no longer there uh, the team lemma included uh, for that matter uh, the the team from the Amhara wing, the Amhara, uh, the ANDM, uh, the, the, the Amhara National Democratic Movement, uh, which is the, the the party in the coalition of the EPRDF that represents the Amhara regional state. Um, Gadu uh, under Gacho was at that time the president of the, the Amhara regional state. So at the forefront of the team lemma were this uh, you know increasing solidarity and, and sympathy between these two parties against the dominant party that, that was the TPLF. So uh, the people that we see at the forefront as Team Lama today are non-existent. And uh, it would, I think it's it's only now the prime minister who's in position. As we see it gradually, Lama Magersa has been isolated. Uh, in fact, he's been placed under house arrest. Um, Gadu was brought into uh, becoming the foreign ministry. Um, after that, he's also replaced um, soon after the war in Tigray uh, broke out, he also gave way. Um, so you don't see, you know, Adisu Araga, we don't see him today as we used to see him. So the four or five people that were at the forefront, um, that includes the mayor, uh, the former mayor of Addis, uh, deputy mayor of Addis Ababa, Takala Uma, he's also no longer, he's a minister, but in a very obscure position today. And so this, this would, uh, you know, tell you how uh, the, 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 prime, the current prime minister has somehow isolated all the people that made him to be who he is as a prime minister today. And um, I think partially uh, that constitutes, you know, looking into the genesis of that constitutes the problem of uh, this uh, pre uh, governing system that the current prime minister follows, which is centering around him and him only. So from a collective uh, leadership that was the, that, that was the EPR Dave, we are now looking at just a single person that is the prime minister and uh, most of it is 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 that um and when he also went on 
um, dismantling the EPRDF, which was, uh, bear in mind, was not a part of the pact that the EPRDF itself did. You know, dismantling itself was not a part. Democratizing itself, reforming itself, was what they have agreed in in, Dece in, in December, January, uh, when, when they sat down for that 17 days of meeting. Uh, but the, the prime minister, once he became a prime minister, uh, went above and beyond in dismantling uh, the governing system that held the country together under the repressive system, of course, but somehow together for 27 years. And that is what paved the way uh, for, for the great split between the TPLF, which is the governing party coming from the Tigray region, uh, regional state, and uh, the prime minister, because uh, the TPLF then refused to join the party that the prime minister was fashioning out of the collapse of the EPRDF, which is the party today known as the Prosperity Party. The TPLF become, became the first party to say, no, I'm not going to join this. Uh, and they have effectively became an opposition party uh, from then onwards. Uh, but this, this, this was not this was not something that happened overnight. From the day the prime minister became uh, a prime minister, the hostilities between the TPA leave and uh, the prime minister himself were very visible, you know, from the language the prime minister adopted and referring to um, to um, the TPLF as a dominant party of the EPRDF, you know, referring to the 27 years as 27 dark years, uh, referring, uh, using euphemisms, uh, words like uh, daytime highness and everything that really riled up the base against um, against the TPLF and also documentaries that were being aired through the national television that would put everything that went wrong in 27 years squarely on the shoulders of the EPRDF. As I said earlier, you know, during this protest uh, in Oromia, for example, we have seen uh, the the local police under the uh, the look the, the regional governing party the Oromia police the Oromia special forces uh, were a part of the killing they were a part of the uh, the repression the crackdown against the protesters and everything but then this this narrative changed when the prime minister came and everything was placed on the shoulder very squarely on the shoulders of the the TPLF and this was not sitting well with the TPLF so the rhetoric became very toxic the language of the politics, the, the language in which they were communicating became very combatant. Uh, and, the, the, and the TPLF eventually really evacuated the center and uh, moved to, to Tigray regional state. From there, you know, that created uh, that physical distance between um, the governing party, between the center and, and uh, if I can say, the periphery in Tigray regional state. And that, so that is, that is really how the, this um, disagreement between, between the two of them uh, was, was seeing no turning point after all. And so this, has, this was consolidated further when um, in March last year, the election board decided to postpone the election that was um, highly anticipated to take place because of the outbreak of COVID. Uh, and the TPLF rejected uh, that decision that was passed by uh, first the electoral board and then second, uh, and of course, uh, by, by, the, by the parliament um, to postpone the election uh, indefinitely. Uh, we could say it indefinitely because the decision was that the election would take place once COVID is deemed uh, no longer a threat to the public safety and, uh, and the health, public health. And so the TPLF outrightly rejected this decision um, on the basis that the decision was uh, reached um, in a way that was constitutionally undermining, uh, legally undermining the constitution. You know, what, uh, what they did was they have uh, referred the issue to the uh, inquiry, uh, to the constitutional inquiry, to the council of the, the, the inquiry of the constitutional council led by uh, the chief justice Maaza Ashanafi. And they went into interpreting the constitution because uh, um, based on the postponement of the election, the, the, the time in office of the prime minister and his party would come to an end, also the parliament would come to an end. And so what to do after that, uh, the, and that's the decision they made. Uh, 
um, through the, 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 the council uh, of the, the, the inquiry, the constitutional council, and they took it to the House of Federation. The House of Federation cemented the decision uh, and uh, decided to postpone the election indefinitely or until COVID was deemed no longer a public health threat. And that is the decision that TPA Live has outrightly rejected and would go on organizing unilaterally its own election in Tigray, uh, would go on organizing um, an election commission of the regional state um, to organize the election because the, uh, the, the electoral board has rejected uh, the TPLF's request to organize the election for it. So that led the TPLF to, to decide as a governing party of the regional state, the Tigray regional state, to decide to organize its own electoral commission. And they did that and they, they held that election on the 9th of September. And that election would uh, be another watershed moment uh, in the relation between the federal government um, led by Abiy Ahmed and uh, the Tigray regional state government now led by the elected uh, President um, De Brazion, uh, Dr. De Brazion. So uh, this, is, this is a very, uh, um, it's, it's a watershed moment and also a very dangerous turn because uh, soon after the TPLF held uh, the, the original election, what happened is the TPLF had decided to delegitimize uh, the federal government which is unelected in the in the words and in the in the terminologies of the TPLF. So they delegitimized the federal government and the federal government delegitimized the regional government. So they went into this mutual delegitimization of one another. Uh, but the federal government would go on taking further measures to uh, punitive measures to um, uh, to communicate with with uh, with the Tigray government at that time. The first one was uh, um, to withhold um, the budget, the subsidiary budget uh, to the regional state. Uh, the federal government said that they, they're no longer going to deal with uh, the elected government in Tigray regional state. Uh, but instead, they would disperse the budget, the subsidiary uh, budget, through the local authority, not through the, the council or through the executive of the TPLF. Uh, and this has, of course, uh, you know, put further uh, precedent in the, in the drift, in the further drift of uh, the relationship between the two, the federal and the Tigray uh, regional state. Um, the, there was also other, other issues um, that the federal government, uh, that the, the regional government was complaining about, for example, the withholding of uh, the safety. Uh, the, the direct cash transfer of the safety net, which is uh, a cash transfer to the poorest of the poor in Tigray regional state, which is uh, coming from mostly the World Bank financed uh, project, um, um, uh, PSNP. And so the regional government was complaining about uh, the federal government's withholding of this uh, uh, subsidy to the poor in the region. Uh, but also other measures, for example, the fight against the local, the desert locust, uh, 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 you know, using using a helicopter to spread, and the federal government, the, the regional government was complaining already that the federal government was not cooperating with it in terms of the fight against um, against the locust. Uh, but there was, uh, you know, the, this this combined things have uh, taken a very dangerous turn in mid-October when the, uh, the, how, the, the, the Speaker of the Federation, uh, we have today, the, the Speaker of the Federation gave a statement in mid, uh, don't, I don't recall the exact date, but in mid-October um, in which he said the federal government is exploring constitutional avenues to intervene in the in the Tigray regional state by deploying the federal police, he gave that statement, and that was really a, a, a very dangerous turning point at that time. Um, uh, when, when the speaker of the federation said that it's within the legal remit of the federal government to send federal forces to the regional state to unseat the regional government that was uh, regionally elected in, in, in September 9th. And this was really a, a, a point of no, no, no return. Uh, and, and I think after that, the preparations were ongoing. The preparations for military intervention in, in Tigray were ongoing after this decision 
by the House of Federation in which he clearly said it is within the legal mandate of the federal government to make an intervention, military intervention using the federal police and federal forces. And that's that I think from that time onwards, the federal government was preparing to militarily intervene in Tigray regional state. Um, and and uh, together with, of course, the Amhara regional state, as it was revealed after that by the chief of the police of the Amhara regional state, which he um, said publicly that the war broke out after they have completed preparation uh, to intervene. And, and I think I'd like to, I think that's a great point of transition into the humanitarian crisis and how uh, Eritrean forces along with the Amhara militia has exacerbated it. And for that, I would like to turn to Maza. One thing, there has been a largely a telecommunication blackout since November 4th. Terms like genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity have uh, been spoken. And there's also been an emphasis of uh, the severity and the lack of need, both food-wise and uh, medical-wise. So I'd like you to touch upon that, uh, the humanitarian situation, talking about not only uh, the food crisis, but also the lapse in health structures and also the sexual and gender-based violence. And how do Eritrean forces and Amhara militias play a role into that? Thank you, Your Salem. It's very hard to speak after Tadala because she did uh, present everything in a very clear manner. Um, so I want to say thank you to that because it's, you know, uh, understanding everything that happened previous to November 4th is very critical in understanding what exactly is happening right now to the people of Tigray. So uh, right after, you know, the Amhara militias and also the Ethiopian troops encircled uh, Tigray and uh, the Ethiopian government led by uh, the Nobel Peace Laureate Abiy Ahmed uh, didn't stop there. They invited the Eritrean troops, an army um, that has been, you know, for, for the past over 20 years has been told that every bad thing that is happening in Eritrea is due to uh, the action or inaction of the people of Tigray and their government. They have been given permission to also besiege Tigray and, and commit crimes uh, against humanity and war crimes. So right after that war started on November 1st, um, you know, communications completely got blocked. Uh, there was no way of knowing what exactly was happening to the people of Tigray in the ground, mainly because the federal government shut down the internet and phone services. Uh, because of that, we were not able to reach out to our family members. We couldn't call. Uh, there was no internet. Everything was, you know, blank block out. Uh, so for for the first like couple of few days, like we knew there was, you know, a military confrontation, but we didn't anticipate it to go, uh, you know, this deep or we didn't anticipate it to, to last this long. So we thought it was something that was going to, you know, uh, come to an end very soon. Uh, this is uh, from you know, uh, an ordinary Tigran perspective. Uh, obviously, if you're an Alanist or if you have been following the political uh, tensions that have been growing within Tigray or within Ethiopia generally, you, you would anticipate that, you know, uh, war was something inevitable, it was going to happen and a lot of people were going to suffer due to that. So some of the, suffer the sufferings that followed the November 4th military attack is, um, first of all, uh, Eritrean troops were not only, um, you know, ravaging cities and, and, and towns across the ground with bombs and uh, constant, you know, shelling, but they were also actively engaged in massacre of the people of Tigray. Uh, particularly younger men, as young as 12 years old, were, you know, taking out of their house. Eritrean troops would literally go home to home, knocking doors and, you know, looking for young men and then they would shoot them right right then. Uh, in addition to this, women uh, have been actively used as, their bodies have been actively used as a battleground, meaning girls, elderly, grandmas, monk, monks, all of this, you know, the female gender was in Tigray, uh, has been used as a weapon to subjugate the people of Tigray, to torture them into silence and, and acceptance of the uh, the ideology that is, uh, you know, uh, being tried to impose in Tigray. So uh, rape has been weaponized, their bodies have been violated, and they have been forced into filling their homes and ancestral land, seeking refugee in Sudan. Uh, as we speak, over 60,000 people, Tigrans, are currently in Sudan. They're seeking shelter and protection there. Uh, over 2.3 million 
Tigrans have also been internally displaced. A uh, majority of this uh, by accounts of the UN are children and then women. Um, over 4.5 over 4.5 million Tigrans are also facing a man-made famine. Uh, this is mainly uh, because you know any edible food crops have been burned. They have been murdered both by uh, air train troops as well as the Amhara militias. So Tigran people are basically being starved subjugation. Uh, there is a massive humanitarian crisis in Tigray, not because the people of Tigray didn't have enough to eat, but because the federal government had invited foreign invader and uh, is working closely with these foreign invaders in order to loot and destroy everything that people could actually use to survive. And to make matters worse, the federal government of Ethiopia wouldn't give unfettered and unrestricted access to international humanitarian aid agencies so that they could deliver much needed uh, humanitarian aid to these people. So because of this, uh, over 4.5 million Tigrans are literally being starved to death as, as we speak. Um, following this, hospitals have been destroyed. Uh, there is literally no medicine in Tigray. And because of that, mothers, pregnant mothers, they couldn't get uh, much needed medical aid. Children, they're lacking on their vaccination and they're because of that, they're exposed to so many other preventable diseases. So this crisis, this war has brought a darkness upon the people of Tigray, a darkness that is not only facilitated through, uh, you know, war armaments, but also through hunger and lack of medication. Um, these are some of the things that, you know, we could touch up on, but I, I think the most grave thing, one of the things that really keeps me up at, at night as a feminist, as a woman, is the weaponized rape. Uh, women in Tigray are being raped day and night. They're being gang raped, not only by Amhara militias or the Ethiopian troops, but also by Eritrean troops. Um, we can speak about some of, you know, the stories that uh, international media uh, persons were able to report on. For example, you can look into the story of Mona Lisa. She's a very young girl who was raped by an Eritrean troop. Uh, she lost, you know, she got injured while she was fighting off or fending her body from a, a troop that was trying to rape her. Uh, we can talk about Lem Lem, a 20 years old young lady who was gang raped by dozens of Eritrean military for over five days. And the pain didn't stop there. Once they finished raping her, they filled they stuffed her private bodies with sharp objects and trash. And we have also heard stories of rape survivors that are currently uh, being sheltered in Sudan. They have told their stories about how they were raped by um, Hara militias. And as they raped them, according to this eyewitness uh, account and the survivors, they were telling them that they were doing it in order to cleanse their body. This is why we say this is a genocide. This is why we say this is this war is unjust war that that is being orchestrated both by the Ethiopian federal government and the Eritrean government in order to exterminate the people of Tigray. So the humanitarian crisis aspect of this aspect of this war is very devastating. However, it's very important to look into the political aspect of it as well because it's the political aspect of the war that has led to this devastating uh, human rights crisis. Um, humanitarian crisis in my opening. Thank you, Maza and all of our other speakers. Um, now we will be opening up to questions from our participants. Um, so if any of you would like to have a question answered by any of our speakers, please post a comment in our Facebook um, live and we will have one of our speakers answer it. Um, one question to start off with that I've already received is, what do you believe will be the long-term effect of this conflict? What are some short-term and long-term solutions to ethnic division in Ethiopia? Um, so if any of our speakers would like to unmute and answer that. Okay, I can jump in at first. Oh, Sadala, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, I was waiting that one of you might, um, might chip in. Uh, I think that the short and the long term, um, the short term um, effect is the suffering of the people of Tigray. 
um, this is um, this is happening as we speak, as Maaza laid it out very uh, clearly. Um, but the long term um, effect is this, uh, um, as I called it, the first day the war broke out is this rupture of the Ethiopian state as we know it, uh, because we we really are not. There is no uh, pause and reckoning of how is. Um, the people of Tigray, how are they or the political order in Tigray the United States going to be re-incorporated uh, into the Ethiopian state? I think the long-term um, effect is that I don't want to preempt that because that is entirely going to be upon the people of Tigray. Uh, but I think this is um, the long-term effect is uh, a, 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 a no political roadmap which would see um, the people of Tigray come back to be a part of the Ethiopian polity as we know it. Um, because um, historically, there is a big disconnect of understanding the people of Tigray. Um, in, in, my, in, my, in my understanding, there is a, a lot and a result um, um, struggle of the people of Tigray that spanned not only uh, the last five months, but, but um, decades um, long for the right to self-administer, the, the, their very, um, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the, their struggle of the, the, the people of Tigray centers around um, that um, self-sustenance and the right to, 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 to administer themselves. And uh, this federal the federal government's um, insistence in seeing the TPLF capitulate completely uh, is, is going to see this rupture expand as we go by, because uh, from our understanding, the TPLF is not just a political party. It is an idea for the people of, of Tigray. Uh, anybody who could read a little bit into uh, the literature, the music, the culture of the people of Tigray would understand that uh, TPLF uh, or, or it is just not a political party. This is one part. The second part, when TPLF was in, in, in power, it was able to establish that bureaucracy, that structure, the governing structure, the uh, infrastructure of the self-government um, in the regional state. And so for the federal government to look into complete erasure of the TPLF would mean the complete erasure of that infrastructure this party has put in place for the last um, 30 years uh, almost. So is it possible to imagine that uh, and, and, and demand the complete demise of the TPLF? This, this is going to put it um, in a very difficult condition and also with no roadmap to reconstitute the people of Tigray back into the Ethiopian polity. So the long-term effect of this war is going to be this very, um, very brutal rupture of the relationship between the people of Tigray and the center and the politics and the federal government. Uh, this, this, this is something that uh, we are not discussing yet, but I see that as a long-term consequence of this war. Thank you so much, Sadala. Um, now we have another question, um, and these two questions are kind of related. Um, so one was kind of a comment asking why this news is not in mainstream media. Um, and then the second related question is, since getting correct statistics and news is hindered now because of surveillance, where do you get your sources? Which websites or accounts do you deem credible? Um, I, I can jump in here. Um, one of the main reasons why the, the crisis in Tigray or the, as, as a Tigran, we refer to genocide in Tigray is not getting enough media coverage is because the timing it was orchestrated, the timing it was waged. It was purposefully waged on November 1st. This is a very critical date because the world was busy anticipating the results of the American election. And in addition to that, there is COVID-19 ravaging you know, the entire world. So the international community is pretty much occupied with this too. At the beginning, it was pretty much occupied with both incidents, you know, anticipating the U.S. elections result, how it was going to go, whether, you know, uh, the, the Trump administration was going to concede or not. And then in addition to that, you have COVID-19 that has be, that has been an issue, the pandemic, and it, it still continues to be an issue. So because of this, 
this is a this is a war that is being fought in the dark. So and also in addition to that, the Ethiopian federal government had you know restricted access, media access, international media corridor to journalists to Tigray for the most part. It's only recently that uh, Abiy Ahmed's regime has been forced into granting access to seven international media outlets. And even if after granting access, he has been actively engaged in arresting journalists and fixers that were supposed to help this international uh, media outlets that enter into Tigray to cover what has happened in the past over 100 days. So there are so many reasons, but one of them, as I said, is lack of access to Tigray. And in addition to that, the uh, you know, the circumstance that we are like globally that we're in, there are so many developments here and there. And because of that, you know, international media tend have a tendency to pick on stories that are, uh, you know, relevant to them. And unfortunately, a group of a group of minority groups being exterminated by a dictator regime doesn't seem to compel international media to, uh, you know, to, to do uh, what you would expect them to do in order to let the international community know about what's happening. Uh, but in, in, regarding the second question, where do you get, you know, some of your real, reliable sources? Uh, Addis Standard is a great one. So I would encourage everyone to go there and to follow because uh, they do give with a very limited access, as I said, uh, that is granted to Tigray. Uh, they do give a very good analysis of what's happening and where exactly it's happening from a very professional perspective. So I would say following that is great. But in addition to that, you can also look into resources coming from the CNN, uh, from the Guardian, the Economist, and what have you. Um, these are also, again, they have journalists, at least in Sudan, talking to eyewitness accounts, talking to survivors of weaponized rape, and also survive, survivors of massacre. Uh, they're trying to document their personal accounts. But most importantly, do also follow Tigran activists because the first thing you have to do in all of this is believe the victims. And Tigrans are the, the, the number one victims of all this horrific, horrific war. So do follow Tigran page, Tigran um, activists, and also Omna Tigray. Omna Tigray does its very best in terms of providing an educated advocacy. Uh, it does very best in terms of, you know, um, providing uh, credible like you know information that can be tracked back to credible sources so these are some of the sources that i suggest for people to follow uh, but i'm sure as a journalist at adam might have um, other insights as well um you, just Ma quickly to add on what um, Mada, Ma maza has uh, put a very good pool of uh, the sources of information but i would add based on our own experience also is uh, to follow um, non, non, non um, conflict party um, institutions such as the UN, the ICRC, uh, the, the MSF, because these institutions are on the ground, even at the time when Tigray was completely shut off from the rest of the world. We depended so much on, on dispatches from the UN OCHA, for example, which is a, an umbrella of uh, several UN organizations that were uh, allowed limited access even during um, the complete shutdown period of time. We do follow um, the Ethiopian Red Cross, the ICRC, uh, MSF, great sources uh, in terms of uh, their, their assessment. Uh, for example, the, the medical situation in Tigray uh, was released um, last week by, by MSF, uh, quite, quite a, a devastating report, uh, and the UN organizations. And so th these are also great firsthand information that are coming. And also because they, they, they tend to um, not rush into putting a blame on this party and that party, but but focus on the humanitarian crisis of, of uh, the situation in Tigray, as they are an apolitical organization uh, uh, providing just humanitarian support. So do follow those, um, those organizations for reliable information as well. Thank you to you both for those explanations. Um, another question we have is, what do you say to those who have been suffering under TPLF for 27 years, but are also devastated by the human rights violations in Tigray? I want to support the innocent people of Tigray, but it's hard to support a movement that denies my ethnicity suffering. I think that's valid. Um, and honestly, and as we outlined earlier in the, whenever there's a one party that's held power for such a long time as has been the case with the TPLF led EPRDF, human rights abuses, um, 
over overreach in terms of political overreach is is going to be more likely. So we definitely do recognize that. However, it's really important during this war that there's a delineation between TPLF and the people of Tigray, because at the end of the day, it wasn't the people of Tigray had uh, weren't the ones they're the ones bearing the brunt of this, despite the fact that they also had nothing to do with the human rights abuses that happened during the TPLF lead. Um, so I don't think those two things are mutually exclusive. You can be um, you can be you know hurt or you can be you can express your frustration with the TPLF if they if you know they did um, impact your specific ethnic group, which we do know there have been several human rights abuses that happened during that period of time. But you can also then advocate as well because advocating for end to genocide, advocating for end to violence against women is not the same thing as supporting the TPLF. Um, thank you. Um, on to another question. This question is uh, directed for its Adala specifically. Um, and the question states, I think a lot of ambivalence or denial surrounding the war in Tigray is the narrative of, quote unquote, 27 years of darkness caused by the TPLF. Can you talk more about how this narrative started and how discussions about the Tigray war can be started with those who hold strong anim animosity against the TPLF? Thank you. Um, this is one of the most painful experience that I have had to go through the last five months personally, and also as a journalist, because uh, as a journalist who have been um, uh, in the era of the TPLF dominated APRLF, I don't know, I don't, I don't think you would find any other journalist that had um, um, really fought the TPLF, uh, led APRLF uh, government so hard, you know, uh, neck and neck. Uh, we've been we've been uh, with a lot of painful experiences as journalists uh, fighting the system that the TPA live um, was was dominating at that time, uh, but we have our because our priorities are amplifying the human rights sufferings of uh, anyone anywhere. Uh, we have continued to do so to 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 to, to do you know to shed light on on the human uh, right uh, on the human suffering of the war in Tigray. And this is now directly taken the you know the narrative is so poisoned that any sympathy that you could show towards what's happening in Tigray today is, uh, is, is taken as a support or you know, an attempt to resuscitate the TPLF um, back to power. Uh, there is nobody else that as a media person that, has fought, that had fought the TPLF as I did, as my team did. But we are now today in the forefront of being accused of uh, a media organization that's supporting the coming back of the TPLF into power. So this, this, is, this is part of, this is the spillover effect of this very poisoned narrative um, th th that's coming directly from the government and aided and abetted by uh, the, 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 the media um, that the government is, is bankrolling, the individuals that the, the government is uh, you know, bankrolling to influence public opinion. Uh, there is just one narrative to that, and that if you show any sympathy, in, initially before the war broke out, the uh, really the rush was to for a, for a dialogue to ho to happen and we've been focusing on you know have a dialogue before the war broke out after the war broke out it was cessation of hostilities none of the terms were accepted you cannot call both of them pre and post war words the way these words were deplatformed is is an indication of of uh, the way this war is being conducted you know um, and so it is very very difficult but it's very important that anybody who would, who would like to see beyond the political gain of the war to resist, to push back against this labeling, against this attack, against, you know, both physically and, and, and the cyber attack. Um, it's very important that people would stand uh, and stand their ground to continue amplifying um, what it is that this country is going to get it's going to get from the senseless war. What do we get at the end? You know, it only requires you to pose and ask some very critical questions. What next? What is it going to be? What do we get out of this war? So it's very important. Anybody who is interested in advocating against this war um, stands their ground because the, the, the harassment is immense and we're going through it today. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. Um, on to the next question. 
It states, with the limitations of humanitarian organizations in these areas of conflict, what initiatives can the diaspora and social activists take to effectively help with these horrific circumstances? So there are numerous things that can be done um, until the humanitarian corridor is extended. And I know Maza probably piggyback off me because she's a very um, in-depth activist in that realm. One thing is you can start well, emailing, mailing your congressmen, your senators, everyone that's in legislature to let them know what's going on, right? And there's several resolutions that have that still don't have a great deal of support in the Senate to get them to support these resolutions to stop the war on Tugai. As we saw in the EU, they have already um, they've already cut some funding to going to Ethiopia. The U.S. also needs to take a hard stance on stopping the war on Tigray. So that's one thing you can do in terms of that. Also, on the ground, there are protests that are happening consistently. There's one coming up in D.C. tomorrow and one in New York on Friday. Those are that also um, adds more attention. There are several. I know the Tigray Development Association is collecting funds that will be going to humanitarian once the corridors are open. So you can preemptively do that as well. So I know. Yeah. Yeah, just to add a few, few points here. Um, what what Dr. Faven suggests is, is great, and I, I feel like it's the easiest thing to do. Uh, however, it's very important to remember that as long as there are invading forces within Tigray, whatever humanitarian aid is delivered to reach to Tigray will not, will not be accessed by the civilians that you're trying to support, the civilians that you're trying to save. So it's very important that you join our efforts and in, in, in our advocacy towards the immediate withdrawal of all foreign forces from Tigray. Uh, this includes air train troops and Amhara militias, as well as the Ethiopian Federal Army that are currently causing havoc and distraction across Tigray. So uh, as, as much as we appreciate the, the concern that is coming, uh, focusing on humanitarian crisis and people are trying to do everything they can uh, you know, to push for unfettered and unrestricted humanitarian corridor to Tigray, it's always important to remember that Eritrean forces need to be out of Tigray so that Tigrans can not only, uh, you know, be able to breathe, but also be able to use the food that is going to be delivered to them. Uh, I say this because there are very, uh, you know, worrisome reports coming from Tigray from the ground, uh, depicting stories of, you know, how the very limited humanitarian access that has been grant granting uh, has enabled some people, especially in Tigray, to have access to humanitarian aid. However, Eritrean troops are, you know, using that aid as an excuse to come rape and even torture further civilians. So um, before, as we push for unfair unfettered and unrestricted human turn access to Tigray, we should also actively, um, you know, advocate for the immediate withdrawal of all foreign forces from Tigray. And you can do this uh, by participating in our protest, but most importantly, by reaching out to your local representatives. It doesn't matter wherever you are. If you're within the States, make sure you call your Congress people, uh, people in Senate and House. If you're in Europe, reach out to your MP members, call them, ask them what exactly they're doing to stop you know, one of the catastrophic humanitarian crisis that's happening in Tigray. Good. All right. Um, well, thank you all so much for all of your wonderful questions. That's all the time we have for questions today. Um, thank you for all the wonderful questions that made this so engaging. And thank you so much to our speakers um, for providing wonderful answers to those questions. Um, moving forward, I urge you all to really take the advice that our speakers gave us to stay involved, call representatives um, and follow um, their organization, Omna Tigray, which does a really great job of keeping us all involved on updates going on. Um, I also wanted to mention that this is going to be recorded and posted and it will be available through Cornell ESA's Instagram page um, and more information will, will follow this as well. Um, I also just want to thank you, Omna Tigray, for collaborating with us, um, as well as our co-sponsors, which is the Ethiopian Air Train Student Associations from Howard, um, Harvard, Emory, and Georgia State. Um, and I also, before we, I let you all go, wanted to mention an event that's happening hosted by um, Emory's um, Ethiopian Air Train Student Union. Um, and it's a great follow-up event because it is a self-care 
event um, and it's a conversation with the counseling and psychology services at their university. Um, and it's really important that as we take action and as we stay involved with what's happening, we also attend to our mental and physical health. So this will be a great event to help us learn tools on how to do so. Um, so once again, I think, wanted to thank you all for attending and making this event happen. And I hope you all have a great rest of your evening.